Uh, greetings, uh, my name is John Savers. Uh, this is Top Hat and Buttered Popcorn. I'm your host, and uh, today we'll consider a recent film uh, that may be showing still in a few uh, theaters in the area, that is Rob Roy. Uh, Rob Roy stars uh, Liam Neeson, uh, John Hurt, who was especially uh, effective as uh, the Marquez of Montrose, um, also uh, Timothy Rolfe, who was um, absolutely uh, splendid in the, the role of Archibald Cunningham. Uh, Jessica Lang was uh, very good as uh, the wife of uh, uh, Robert Roy McGregor. Um, all in all, a very good production. And uh, the music uh, by uh, Carter Burwell was uh, uh, very effective. It had a, um, a wonderful uh, melodic line that um, played through, uh, usually with uh, uh, violin, uh, occasionally blending in with horn and um, a bagpipe. Um, there were elements of uh, this particular film uh, that uh, reminded me of uh, Brave Heart. Of course, we saw something of the same terrain, uh, the uh, uh, rolling kind of mountainous hills uh, and valleys and uh, the muted colors and um, uh, of green, gray, brown, drabs. Um, uh, we uh, find ourselves at the very outset of this film. As an aside, this film was uh, produced by Peter Bruin and uh, Richard uh, Jackson. Uh, the direction was by Michael Caton uh, Jones. Uh, and the screenplay, which was uh, very effective, uh, Alan Sharp. Um, we, we have an opening here in this particular film of a, sort of a pan of the um, uh, landscape of uh, Scotland. Uh, and uh, it begins to focus on a, a group of uh, uh, Scotlanders. Um, it's uncertain exactly who they are. They seem like a motley crew. And um, lo and behold, we, we see another group of men, uh, a smaller group that seem to be spying on the first group. And um, we begin to learn that this second group is headed by Robert Roy McGregor. Now, uh, the last time we ran into the McGregors, they were uh, joining the Wallace clan in the uprising uh, in Braveheart. Uh, uh, now, in this particular episode, uh, which uh, takes place about 1713, uh, we find that the uh, Scots are still having a pretty tough time, the ordinary Scotsman a pretty tough time um, economically. Uh, they have apparently a famine going and that uh, in the best of times it's pretty tough in Scotland, you get the impression. Uh, many of the Scots have left for the United States of America and uh, those that remain are um, uh, getting by as they may. And some of them were choosing to be cattle rustlers as it were um, uh, to get by. Um, it was, unfortunately, um, a group of cattle owned by, uh, under the, um, the uh, control or protection of Robert uh, Roy McGregor, that um, uh, these people, these, uh, this gaggle of uh, uh, desperate uh, individuals had taken, and uh, uh, this cost uh, their leader his life, or, uh, Robert Roy McGregor was a person who was willing to act as judge, jury, and executioner. Uh, and he put the uh, tinkerer, a fellow that he knew some years back uh, from a sporting event, um, he put him to a quick death with a sword uh, thrust from back through front. Uh, now this did not sit too well with uh, the people uh, who were headed by this gent, but um, uh, particularly a, a woman, but um, be that as it may, um, it did uh, make the point that cattle were, were returned. Uh, and we, we see a kind of a stern justice here. Uh, yet, um, when uh, Robert 
Roy McGregor gets back to his own clan, uh, the village there, and looks over the distress in that particular village, the hunger and hard times, uh, he decides to uh, peel off one of the uh, beasts, one of the cattle, um, and uh, give it to these people to slaughter uh, for food. So there is a kind of uh, moral uh, uh, ambiguity here. From the point of view of his clan and the people about, the ordinary people, he may f appear to be uh, a very generous benefactor, magnanimous, um, uh, a good uh, leader. And yet, um, uh, from the point of view of uh, the Marquis of Montrose, um, whose cattle, I believe, he was uh, protecting, uh, it must appear to be a uh, kind of a poaching or theft. So uh, I see a certain moral ambiguity, and um, this, the sword which was used to kill the tinkerer might just as easily have been used to uh, uh, bring justice to Robert Roy McGregor, be that as it may. Thereafter, Settling back into his uh, home, uh, he has a freeholder. He has some um, 300 uh, acres or so uh, property and is basically the head of the clan. And uh, also, uh, he is looking at this time after the, um, some members of the clan Ross, as I understood. Now, the um, uh, events here become uh, rather domestic. We see him with his wife, um, his children. Uh, it is a completely uh, pleasant uh, domestic life. Uh, uh, his concerns are completely domestic as a husband. Um, and uh, we, uh, we kind of leave at this juncture. And we're introduced to the Archibald Cunningham character. The Archibald Cunningham character is played just marvelously, wonderfully by uh, Timothy Roth. And, um, uh, he is also um, an aide, so to speak, uh, a guest um, of the Marquez of Montrose, uh, played wonderfully also by John Hurt. Uh, uh, now, these two uh, provided very strong um, uh, acting uh, force for the antagonist side. Um, they were apparently loyalist uh, to the English throne, and their position um, was such that um, uh, a kind of a competition existed um, because there were many um, supporters of James in Scotland. And amongst these, uh, the Duke of Argyll, and also, at least by repute, the MacGregors. Now, this kind of sets up a conflict in the way which will um, uh, be magnified as time goes by. Um, now, at, at the first outset, uh, when looking at uh, Archibald Cunningham, he appears to be a total f fop, a, a weak individual. He appears to be sissy. Uh, his uh, style, his um, uh, is, is a very steadied pose of the etiqu etiquette uh, uh, of the court, apparently at this time, is, is rather exquisite. Uh, they have uh, the use of makeup, uh, and they have the wigs, and uh, rather grand uh, wigs at that. And the clothing uh, tends to be extravagant, um, and uh, <coughs> the Marquez of Montrose uh, wishing to be uh, in keeping with the other lords of the realm uh, who are uh, uh, conscious of the ways of the court, uh, he also adopts uh, this style, this pose. So the casual observer would be completely mistaken about the uh, very lethal nature of Archibald Cunningham, who it turns out is a very accomplished swordsman. In fact, the character Archibald Cunningham in some ways reminds me of the character of Wilson in the movie Shame, uh, just as the character of Rob Roy 
reminds me a little bit of Shane himself, played, of course, by Alan Ladd, and that very good Western. Because there's something about this particular movie uh, that has a good deal in common with uh, the American West movies, the Western movies. Uh, and it might may well be because so many of those Western movies were made by Irishmen. But uh, be that as it may, um, the, the Archibald Cunningham is apparently a um, legitimate uh, uh, son of a, um, uh, a woman of um, unclear reputation. <coughs> uh, he does not know who his father is, but uh, has been told by his mother that perhaps this man, perhaps that, uh, perhaps a noble, perhaps an adventurer. He does not know. There's a good deal of anger in this guy, uh, a good deal of hatred, malice, and a um, and, and sense of being robbed, I suppose. He's also uh, in economic uh, tight uh, straits at this time. Supposedly, he was sent by his mother uh, to stay with Marquez of Montrose um, <clears throat> so that the climate of Scotland could act in a soothing way on his uh, fevered blood. Uh, when the Duke of Argyll heard this, he asked, well, tell me, uh, Archie, uh, what, uh, what uh, has caused this fever in your blood? Is it dice, uh, brid, uh, or, or perhaps buggering of boys? And uh, then we have the very singular conversation that follows in which um, uh, Archibald Cunningham states, well, um, he uh, has not buggered a boy for many years. And in his defense, on the occasion that he did, he had thought uh, that the boy was a girl until penetration. And this leads to a great deal of um, comments about the English confusing ass and quim. And um, of course, the Scot uh, derided the English. And, and so you see that there is still a good deal of antagonism uh, that exists between Scot and England, Englishmen, um, just as you saw this in the Braveheart, uh, although in Braveheart it was more of a pronounced uh, antagonism, uh, since you um, by now have got um, a uh, amalgamation uh, to a certain extent of Scotland into uh, the English culture. And of course, we see this in the affectations of the, Mon the Marquez of Montrose. Even so, now uh, the conversation between uh, the Marquez of Montrose, uh, Archibald Cunningham, the Duke of Argyll, and the Duke of Argyll's uh, number one. Uh, sportsman at that time, uh, kept uh, kind of as a, um, for his uh, swordsman uh, skills, a, a German named Guthrie, who looked uh, very uh, crude indeed, and um, had very terrible teeth, uh, and uh, a rather sizable fellow. And uh, so anyway, when he hears that, um, uh, that Archibald Cunningham uh, could not tell, as the Duke of Argyll put it, uh, asked from Quim, um, he said that he understood that many Englishmen had that problem. And uh, this leads to a duel between Archibald Cunningham uh, and this fellow Guthrie, who is the champion at that point in time uh, of the Duke of Argyll. A bet is promptly waged, and uh, they sit down to see the show. Of course, further, uh, during this particular conversation, uh, Archibald Cunningham uh, has displayed already that he has a good deal of uh, backbone to him because he has promptly begun to denigrate the um, uh, swords of Scotland. And uh, uh, the Duke has said, you do not uh, uh, think too much of our Highland tools. And uh, uh, Archibald Cunningham had uh, made some sort of comment, well, if I were going to um, 
uh, sleigh and ox, of course, I would choose a, a cleaver of this kind. But uh, at any rate, um, uh, the swords being used in Scotland at this time are very similar to those uh, that were used um, or available uh, to the Wallace clan during the uprising uh, in Braveheart. Of course, in the movie Braveheart, uh, the English had outlawed the use of swords. Um, weaponry is not, it, it's not something that is uh, a good idea to allow in groups that are hostile toward one's regime. And uh, the uh, Scots of those times, uh, circa 1280 to 1314, uh, uh, were generally, and prior no doubt, uh, barred from these kinds of weapons. And so, uh, as one of the Scots of the time told um, William Wallace, um, we are left with rocks and presumably staves and crude farm uh, implements, uh, instruments uh, to uh, defend themselves. But uh, by now they're well amalgamated and um, again allowed to use swords. Uh, and the swords they use are the same kind of broad uh, 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 double edge and single edge uh, types, uh, uh, kind of uh, similar to a saber in the way. Um, but perhaps a little thicker. Now, what is interesting also about this particular duel is that it brings out um, the ever-developing technology of war, or death, if you prefer. And it, uh, perhaps coming from France, uh, a new sort of sword uh, had entered into the English uh, realm, a sword which is uh, more round and lean, and uh, looks uh, more like a large ice pick. Um, I believe that they're called something of the sort, like an epe. But uh, these particular swords were not used so much as cleavers. They were not slashing weapons, of which, of course, the uh, Middle Eastern scimitar was the perhaps a uh, apex or acme of, uh, of that sort of slashing weaponry. But these were meant for stabbing. And although Archibald Cunningham, in using his weapon, uh, demonstrated it had a certain slashing quality also, uh, its primary lethality rested in the stab. Now, um, this particular weapon was an advance because it was lighter, more maneuverable, um, and uh, this gave an advantage to uh, a little fellow like Archibald Cunningham, which otherwise he would not have. If he had to wield the kind of weaponry that the Scots were uh, fond of using, he would no doubt have been cut in two quickly. But uh, he turned out to be very accomplished with the weapons, uh, the new weapons, and it kind of reminded me in the way of the old Wild West expression, uh, God did not make men equal. Mr. Colt did, of course, referring to his six-shooter. So um, the um, champion of uh, the Marquez uh, of Montrose, Archibald Cunningham, uh, defeated the champion of uh, the Duke of Argyle. Uh, bets were made, so money was passed. And um, a lesson was learned, uh, both by the Duke, uh, by Guthrie, perhaps by the Marquez, and certainly by the viewer, because the, the true nature of Archibald Cunningham um, was something of a surprise. Um, now, uh, Archibald first uh, encounters uh, Rob Roy uh, when Rob Roy uh, comes to see the Marquez of Montrose in regard to a loan, a, uh, a loan that um, was going to be collateralized by the acreage he owns. Uh, his idea was basically very familiar to uh, American viewers, certainly of my age, that is uh, 
a cattle, a cattle drive um, to take uh, cattle about uh, cheap to sell deer at a uh, location uh, in which uh, the price could be got. That being so, the deal was made um, and uh, it was to be a paper, a note, uh, a letter of credit sort of uh, arrangement. Um, the uh, Rob Roy clan uh, had uh, kind of settled back for a, um, a bit of merriment, uh, dancing and so forth like this. Um, and um, a um, trusted uh, associate of Robert Roy McGregor, uh, uh, McDonald, um, different clan, but uh, uh, a fellow who uh, was uh, something of the right-hand man of uh, McGregor, um, was trusted to consummate this deal. And when he went to a, uh, a factor, the factor of the Marquez, uh, he found that uh, the rules had been changed because this factor is a very deceitful individual, duplicitous to the core. And uh, we're reminded once again of uh, the problems that our heroes have in these movies uh, uh, with um, traitors and with deceitful people and so forth. Um, of course, um, the problem that William Wallace faced uh, in Scotland was uh, the duplicity of the nobles and uh, spectacularly that of the uh, 17th Earl of Bruce. But um, over here, we have more of a mundane uh, uh, betrayal. And in fact, it kind of points a finger toward the future. That is the factor, the uh, banker, the accountant, uh, this sort, as being the um, um, real villain, or part of the real villain structure anyway. And uh, he is working hand in glove with Archibald Cunningham. Archibald Cunningham has already been shown to be a man uh, with almost no money. In the factor um, about uh, the idea of stealing the thousand dollars, which the mark, uh, the thousand pounds uh, um, from um, uh, Rob Roy, um, uh, he was all ears. And um, the idea was very simple. That was that combining the swordsmanship and lethal nature of Cunningham with um, a switch in the deal by the factor, uh, changing a letter of credit into a bag of gold coins, um, well, um, uh, this, this was a plan that was made to work, made to order, and in fact, it did work. So that. So reluctantly takes the bag, the bag of gold, uh, uh, the coins, and um, sets off. Um, at this very same time, there's very interesting uh, celebration and merriment uh, going on at the uh, McGregor clan uh, locale with uh, some very interesting singing and so forth, music. Having a grand time, uh, unfortunately, uh, McDonald does not. Uh, he is um, uh, pursued by uh, Archibald Cunningham, he is eventually treed and he is uh, murdered. Uh, the, the gold is taken and um, uh, the terms of the uh, contract uh, were such that uh, if McGregor could not pay in three months, his lands were forfeit, uh, he could not uh, come up with the money. Uh, and this led him to choose a kind of brigand or uh, outlaw um, uh, status. Uh, he began to attack the uh, cattle, sheep, and other uh, property of the Marquais. Um, I don't know if he did this in an absolutely open kind of way, but uh, it was not hard to figure out who was doing it. And, um, um, and this uh, got the attention of the Marquis, who uh, set about to capture uh, Rob Roy and uh, presumably hang him. Further, the pursuit of Robert Roy McGregor uh, is placed in the, in the hands of um, Archibald uh, Cunningham. And uh, he's a very good person to put it into. His notion, of course, is to set a trap and again, this sort of recapitulates the trap that was made for William Wallace in Braveheart. Um, they go for the woman. 
And um, in this particular instance, uh, Archibald Cunningham rapes the, um, the wife of uh, Robert Roy, uh, this being Jessica Lange, played by Jessica Lange. Uh, and not only this, but it turns out that uh, not only is um, this puny looking fellow um, uh, lethal and so forth, he apparently is rather virile because uh, she immediately gets pregnant and uh, starts carrying his child. Well, this resonates in a way um, the whole concept of the law of prima nocte, which we encountered in William Wallace uh, during uh, his time um, uh, in Braveheart. Two, Robert Roy uh, finally learns uh, that his wife has been raped by uh, Archibald Cunningham, that she is pregnant. That being so, a kind of finale of uh, swordsmanship, uh, a showdown, um, a very reminiscent of the way things were done in those uh, Western movies of yore. But uh, at any rate, um, the um, sword chosen by Robert Roy is the uh, traditional Scott Cleaver, the uh, broad sword. So that the uh, fight uh, commences uh, in a kind of um, a cavernous, um, perhaps barn-like structure. Uh, consider, and it, it looks like a mismatch. But uh, once again, uh, as with Guthrie, uh, Cunningham shows his prowess, and he begins to nick um, Rob Roy. And uh, in many ways, this whole affair began to remind me of a bullfight in which the bull played by Rob Roy is nicked and wounded uh, as they do in those bullfights. They uh, you lace the back of the bull with wounds to weaken it, to make it uh, more susceptible to the prowess of the matador. And um, Cunningham looked very much like the matador. In conclusion, the movie ends in uh, a rather nice, uh, domestic, uh, promising kind of way. It, it looks like status quo ante for, um, for the McGregor clan. And um, so it turns out to be an interesting movie, uh, and uh, uh, we um, think it's worth seeing.